What's up, Call of Duty fans? Welcome back. This will be a little bit of a different video for you guys, as you'll mostly be dealing with me talking to you guys about franchising. Now, before I go into it, if you have no idea what's going on with franchising, what it means, why it's coming to Call of Duty, and what we're going to be referencing to throughout the majority of this video, pause this video now, go to the little card tab up there or the description to the video in my description below, because it goes over all of the things that you need to know about city geolocation for franchising coming in 2020. I hit all of the key tunes in that video right there. Just to give you a wrap though, in case you have already seen that or need a little bit of a refresher, keep in mind that 2020 will be the CWL as GeoCity location franchising. Each of those franchising spots initially were proposed to be at a minimum of $25 million per spot. That was $5 million more than the Overwatch League was in its first season. And honestly, that's quite a tall ask especially since a lot of the revenue you think would be based off these geolocated cities would be for the branding in a game that's primarily followed in the North American and the far Western European region. Puts out an interesting situation because a lot of big esports investors are in China and South Korea, where this game is essentially not even really looked at whatsoever. So it'd be interesting to see what happens. As far as the rumor mill goes so far, we know that there are five confirmed teams. I'll talk about those five specific teams a little bit later. But more importantly, we're hearing rumors that the LA specific city franchise spot is apparently going for 60 million plus as reported by Codburner, which again, I say reported very loosely when it comes to Codburner. I will be talking mostly through this next video though about things about format, why you need to stop freaking out about all the things you read from Codburner or CW Intel, give you some perspective. And then a second video will be coming up after this that talks about each of the individual teams that could potentially also be interested buyers for the upcoming 2020. So again, this is mostly to put a lot of you guys at ease when it comes to, oh, this system is terrible. Why are they getting rid of all of our players? Why is there an open fantasy draft? You gotta keep in mind that these things are leaks. They are not official announcements or reports from official sources. These are leaks with very little information. Typically think about a leak as being the iceberg where you get 10% of the information, but the core of it is below the surface. So let's talk about the format things that we know of now versus what we can expect for the future. Keep in mind that everything you know from this year in 2019 was set up as a test run year for the franchising coming in 2020. That was initially essentially announced at the initial reveal come last fall when they were announcing the schedule and things going forward with the Call of Duty World League. They talked about how there would be 16 set teams with no relegations, there would still be individualized events, but there would be a difference as far as how you go from the open bracket to being a consideration for a pro team or to face the pro teams. The pro teams were completely isolated from the open division, except for world championships, which would be a total of 32 teams, including obviously the 16 pro teams and the top 16 after the open qualifier of the semi-pro or amateur teams as we know them now. So the format should stay the same. Expect to see the same kind of events. Expect to see places like Anaheim going through, possibly also London after that nutty crowd, but also places like Dallas and maybe more in the future. Expect those events to still happen, where there's pro league events that happen there, but also open or amateur or semi-pro, however you want to nomenclature it, the semi-pro scene would also be there as well. The biggest thing that we're hearing about now comes down to these draft or player selections. And before I go too far into this video, if you guys have not had a chance to watch Lando with the UMG Events YouTube channel, he talks very well about why a fantasy draft would likely not happen. But I also want to put your kind of notions to rest here because the proposal is just that. It is a proposal. This was the same kind of proposal that happened with the Overwatch League initially, where it was the Overwatch teams that buy in will have to get rid of all their contracts. Every single player will be available for every single team. It would be a draft-like or a combine where players can be picked or hand-selected by these teams to represent their cities. That didn't happen. And Overwatch at the time was a much younger, less established scene than we currently have with individual players in the Call of Duty scene. We've got pros that have been playing the game competitively and professionally for up to eight plus years. And most of those players have landed at what they call a home, like for instance, Skump at Optic. You talk about people like Zuma and FaZe, Huke with Envy. Those are long-standing expensive contracts of the likes that Overwatch had not even had to worry about. Of course, now you've got some franchise players with certain geo-specific located cities, but 
you did not have the level of a Scump or a Clayster or a Hugh going through like they are in Call of Duty, like they were in Overwatch before the Overwatch League existed. So the chances of that happening where orgs that are buying into these Call of Duty World League spots for 2020, they will not be willing to nullify contracts. But beyond that, the players will not be willing to go to a upstarter team from who knows where to try to give themselves another shot with new players. Or a situation where the orgs themselves would say, yes, I'll nullify this contract so I can adhere to the rules now why would they do that they would only reason they would even consider that is if activision was like yeah we'll buy out your players so they're technically a free agent from the call of duty activision market kind of like how the nfl has a free agency and things like that that's still not going to happen. You got to remember that Decimate from G2 after the Pro League qualifier was put on restricted free agency, meaning that he had, his contract had to be bought out from G2 to get picked up. And that was at a rumor $200,000. There's no way that you're going to see all of the franchise and kind of stapled players for our top five, top six teams get picked up off of a contract like that there's absolutely no way so before you freak out about player selection you need to remember that there's likely not a situation that actually happens it didn't happen for overwatch it'll likely not happen for call of duty not with all the contracts that are there with star players kind of finding their homes instead they would probably retire and then past that if you're missing all of your star personalities there's no way people would stay invested and do watching the call of duty world League at that point now beyond that is this draft selection process up to potentially picking up new players? Is there an opportunity for essentially, think about it this way. Let's say stage one of the franchising for teams is you get to have your contracted players and also have a roster movement period where you're picking up players as you see fit and contracting them for the year. Okay, but what about all the other players that were not selected? Maybe there's going to be an open type of an event where it's kind of like the League of Legends Combine, or if you remember back to the Crusher 99 that the Overwatch League kind of promoted everything behind the Overwatch League as far as coming up from the open style, not being known to being a big household name. Maybe there's something involved with that, and that could be potentially a thing ran with these tent pull events that are coming through, which I'll talk about more later as far as what a tent pull event is and how that could potentially play into the format. That is very possible, and another opportunity for the amateurs to potentially get more looks let's be honest there is no tier two scene at the moment there is nothing involved with an official league it's usually just pickup events or national qualifiers that are mostly ran by pickup groups that just come together because they're from the same region more on that later the biggest thing for me when it comes down to it is not necessarily the format of the pro league but what happens to the amateurs beyond now there like i mentioned there is no tier two or what the overwatch scene calls the contender scene at the moment Essentially what the leak is telling us is that there will be an opportunity for pro league teams to run localized circuits that could potentially facilitate as a qualifier for open events. So the best way of saying this and what we know now is in 2019, we have these three CWL open events that run in alongside the main pro league tournaments that are happening. But on top of that, there are also ways for teams to participate in an open fashion. You either go through again, the CWL national qualifier and get flown out by activation blizzard or you just show up and buy a team pass to get there now i can't say for sure but it kind of feels like they're trying to formalize who can get to these cwl events by listing it as a tent pool event we'll talk more about what a tent pool is here in a future but essentially the local idea is that pro team cities can run local circuits whether they are online or LAN, and then a certain top amount of teams whether they're just the winners or a couple of teams will get compensated to go to these tent pole events the actual english that's written up in the cod burner post reads as each call of duty league team will host city circuit events in their local markets the league may provide the opportunity for winners of these events to compete on behalf of the teams or again market uh, as a part of a league-wide city circuit at a league tent pole event okay teams may operate their city circuit event as an online or LAN event teams must adhere to game mode rule blah 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 um the league office will determine the official name and brand architecture of the city circuit asset in coming months so again you're looking at a situation here where for instance let's say that the atlanta rain and the atlanta market is running the atlanta rain open circuit that is open to from what i can anticipate everybody who's around the area whether you want to travel far or near you can go and participate at these and these will serve as what it seems to be regional qualifiers so you have your national qualifiers that we know now but there will also seem to be regional qualifiers that will also get you a spot at these tent pole events now before we dig more into the actual visualization of this 
let's talk about what ten pole events are. A ten pole event is essentially what we currently have with the open tournaments being ran at a pro league event. Okay, ten polling is essentially the strategy to take one specific market or product and put it in the center so other ancillary tie-ins can benefit off of the exposure that the main event does. So, in more plain English. The fact that the opens are being ran at the same location as pro events is a key consideration. The tent pole portion of that is the pro event tournament happening at CWL London. While people are there, though, there's also the way to spread the exposure over to the open events. So literally, replace tent pole event with what you currently know as being a CWL open. The goal here seems to be establishing more of a for formal scouting ground for semi-pros and amateurs alike. So essentially, the kind of way that this could potentially move is that the local city circuits could send teams to these open events on an official qualified status as an academy team or a different branded team, as well as there being the already established national qualifiers and the potential of other weekly qualifiers as well was also mentioned in that. Now, it also says that these events and these things that are going on will be happening at the same time or run in parallel to the current league. It's confusing on multiple levels, right? But I only have one real question. Is it like the open events now? in the future but with a more precursor of stage teams more formally so for instance you already have your national qualifiers and you have your open team passes are you going to be expanding that to have your national qualifiers your regional qualifiers and also open teams or will the open tournaments no longer be open to everyone and only the teams who qualify through local circuits or national online qualifiers be included? So take a look at this graphic here. This is how I think it might be ran at worst case scenario where it is very selective and very formalized. If it is very formalized, you're likely going to be looking at the local circuit where you have your team-based cities running their own kind of events through the pro teams. If you win those, you get an official qualification into the open events, but you also have the opportunity to also qualify through the national qualifier, where again, you'll be able to play with teammates specifically from your same country. Then you would go to the open event, which who knows, there might not be open team passes anymore. It might just be you have to do well at a regional or national qualifier to get considered to be brought to these open events. Or it might be as we know it now, but with the expansion of getting your travel paid for you if you win a regional event. We're not 100% sure on how that's going to happen. But as far as I think, as far as like how you're going to move from amateur into a more formalized tier two scene. It's going to be the local circuit open to anybody, the national qualifiers, which again are currently open to anyone as long as you're from the same country. If you do well there, you get your travel paid for you to get to these open events that we currently know. So again, the giant format, the macro of the format will likely not change. It just comes down to what are we actually going to be doing with the other teams? Are there going to be team passes or do you have to now qualify for these open events that's the biggest question that i have a lot of information there i'll continue to kind of go over that as we get more uh, info or intel from these leaks and proposals that we see but so far it feels like each pro league team we can host and will host localized circuit events which will probably be isolated tournaments the top teams from those tournaments will get compensation to go to these open events with other regional and national qualifiers. So instead of seeing 300 teams at these open events, these major open events, you're going to be seeing teams that have qualified to get there. So it actually formalizes it to an open semi-pro pro. There's a stage there. You have your open at the local level, you have your semi-pro at the major events, and then you have your pro league. That's the best way of explaining it. I know I just said that like five different times, but that's how I anticipate it so far. Everything else that you're hearing is rumors. I hate doing videos like this because I don't have solid information to go off of, and I feel like I sometimes would give a bad impression. We will not know anything about 2020 for sure until it comes out of the mouth of Activision. They're the ones in charge of setting things up. That's the only thing you can go off of as far as this will happen. Everything else right now is this might happen, and some of those mights are more stretches of the imagination than actual reality. Let's switch the conversation, get you off my face as focused, and talk about the five teams that have been confirmed so far. Again, I anticipate there being 16 total teams for the first season of the CWL in franchising. 
These are the first five. All of them are Overwatch League investors, and I think they got priority because, again, Activision are the ones running the Overwatch League and want investors and owners that already know their system. So first and foremost, let's talk Team Envy. They are 100% confirmed as being the Dallas team of obviously having ownership from the Dallas Fuel in the Overwatch League and multiple stakes in major titles. It was pretty expected to see Envy being one of the first investors into the CWL franchise spot. Again, it'll be out of Dallas, Texas. However... An interesting post was made by Envy's Twitter looking for suggestion for team names. Now, I in my previous video was thinking that if there were to be Envy buying in from Dallas, they would just be known still as the Dallas Fuel since there are already stadiums being built that are branded under only the Overwatch team. Cite your sources with the Philadelphia Fusion building the Fusion Stadium. So, would it make more sense to keep the current structure that you have with the Dallas Fuel and just make it the Dallas Fuel Overwatch team and the Dallas Fuel Call of Duty team? This could be just an instant reaction to try to get interactions on Twitter, or it could be something that there are actually explicit rules in place that keep the Overwatch League brands out of CWL, where essentially the Overwatch League brands are just that. You cannot kind of dip your toe into multiple pools with the same brand. So it might be a situation where the Dallas team owned by the Envy would not be the fuel. Maybe there's a situation here because Envy is so established as a Call of Duty team that they could potentially become the Dallas Envy. That would make a very easy transitional sense. The name makes sense. It doesn't feel facetious. Like, you wouldn't be able to call them, like, the Houston Optic. That would be weird. So, it's possible that this could be a Dallas team branded for, away from something else besides the fuel. Next team up, Splice, also known as Overactive Media. Again, another no-brainer here with the purchase of the Toronto Defiant going into the Overwatch League. You figured that Splice would also be buying into Toronto for their Call of Duty team for 2020. That will, in fact, happen. In fact, the Twitter for Toronto COD um, has already kind of posted a video with the current Splice mentality. So, again, that tends to lead me toward the expectation that there will be no player drafts because those contracts are pretty much set in stone. Now, I was a little personally surprised with the Overwatch team that it was not a more snake-like mascot for Toronto. Initially, there were some rumors thinking that it would be the Toronto Venom with the Overwatch League. Maybe they'll do something with it here as that snake branding, again, is more formidable in the Call of Duty scene than it is it was, I guess, in the Overwatch scene. New teams that will be involved that we will hear from so far will be the New York squad, mostly pulled out from Sterling Enterprises, is the majority owner of most of New York sports and mostly facet behind the Mets. But again, with the performance level that the New York Excelsior has brought to the table, not only is that going to make sense for New York to get involved because they've been finding some success in results, but New York also boasts some of the highest success in brand merchandising. And it only made sense that this buy would happen to Call of Duty sooner rather than later. I saw people in New York saying that they could find more Excelsior gear in the city than they could Mets gear. I think that says something about how the push in esports in New York is going. The Excelsior brand also lends a hand to the state motto of New York, so it'll be interesting to see if they will brand in tune with that same state heritage or if they'll go with something different. In before there's a throw to the state nicknames and they become the New York Empire. That could be a badass team name. Or they could go something a little bit more childish with going off of the state fish and maybe we'll get the New York Brook Trout. <laughs> the other one coming in and not a surprise either was Atlanta buying into a spot behind the back end of the Atlanta Esports Ventures. Again, this is a conglomeration between Cox Enterprises and Province who recently bought into the Atlanta Reign and has been feeling a lot of hot success, not only off of the team performing well, but also the wide appeal of Atlanta as a whole for Esports. The Reign specifically have been given a chance to host one of the home stands that have be coming up in Stage 3 of the Overwatch League at the Cobb Energy Center. And Atlanta itself, again, is huge in promoting local esports. you got to keep in mind that this is also the breeding ground behind E-League, so it makes sense to have more investment in a huge market in the NA sports scene. Maybe this is the next possible scene that will actually pull the trigger on a dedicated esports arena. Again, they just rebuilt the Brave Stadium, so there's very much so a possibility that, that happens. The fifth and final spot that we'll see will actually be going to Paris, which is really interesting because I had a hard time finding information on what is listed as Contact Gaming, which is their owners, but it's puzzling because these first five spots, again, were mentioned to be going to Overwatch League owners, and the Paris Eternal owner is Drew McCourt, who is the CEO of DM Esports. So a little bit of confusion as far as what the ownership title actually is. Is Drew involved in multiple facets? Who knows? The biggest thing that I'm excited about with the Paris team is as you look at the Paris Eternal, this is a city that's very proud of the identity of French players. The Eternal had picked up Nico, Hip, Ben Best, but also, of course, the notable player in Soon. 
So I would not be surprised to see if the current French CWL players in Whalers and Breezy would be picked up as a backbone to this team being a French Paris-based team. You also have to keep an eye on the other three players, Zeke, Risk, and Natche, who were previously performing with Denial in overtime. They have currently gone out on Twitter and said they're looking for a dedicated fifth to finish out the full season alongside those three plus Mad Cat. So if they end up doing very well, is there a possibility that that same five-man French team gets picked up to become the Paris squad? I think if they perform well, it very well could be the case because, again, I think Paris will more identify with their local markets and their local players than going for the all-stars that might be available. That's going to recap this, a longer video for you guys, but I want to put to bed all of the anxiety that you guys seem to be feeling about. This system is stupid. I hate this. We don't know anything about it. We know proposals. There nothing has been officially established besides these five teams that we mentioned earlier today. So I'll be keeping my eye very closely on the franchising. I have a lot of information as far as how things have gone with Overwatch in the past, which makes me feel pretty much like an expert in this industry when it comes down to what Activision is likely looking for, as well as what my next video will be coming into play with, which is who could potentially be the other buyers looking into spots for the CWL. That'll be a fun one to do. Do not miss that. Until next time, though, hope you guys enjoyed this one and hope you keep holding it down. Later, later. Bye-bye. Thank you.